Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and today we're going to discuss the management of locally advanced triple negative breast cancer with Dr. Stefan Gluck, professor of medicine, University of Miami. Dr. Gluck, as we discussed earlier uh, with triple negative breast cancer, let's talk about the treatment now. Uh, let's assume that the patient has had a biopsy and they've already gone undergone resection of the mass and they come to you. Can you, can you please explain what happens next if they've had either lymph nodes that have been negative versus lymph nodes that have been yeah. positive? So we are assuming this patient has had definite surgery, as we call it. Yeah. means the surgery the procedures are done and they are all sufficient, which means the tumor was resected in total, there is no uh, margins that are affected with cancer, and the lymph node uh, in the axilla was also assessed uh, uh, correctly. So for example, uh, central lymph nodes were done, and if they are negative, then it's enough, and if they were positive and bulky, then you would resect, the surgeon would resect more. So this is done. So now I have the staging that we discussed before, so I will assign to the patient the, the stage of the disease, T1, N1, M0, for example, and then we look at the receptors, and we discussed that the triple negative means estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 receptors are negative, and it impacts the treatment in a major way. Why? Because the estrogen progesterone receptor are those receptors that make the cancer cell sensitive to and important to estrogen. Meaning if I use an anti-estrogen treatment, it's good against cancer. But this patient with triple negative does not have these receptors. So I cannot use drugs such as tamoxifen, such as aromatase inhibitors. HER2 is another receptor, and we do have two targets or two medications we could use potentially, uh, and there are many more in, de in development, but this patient has HER2 negative breast cancer, 1, 2, 3 negative. So I cannot use the trastuzumab or receptin or lapatinib or type of drugs. Type of drugs. So the only thing to improve survival and with this, reduce recurrences, substantially actually, is to give her chemotherapy after such surgery. Mm -hmm. Now the second thing is, if the tumor was big, or if the tumor had many lymph nodes involved, then one would also add radiation. Or, if the patient did not have mastectomy, just lumpectomy, radiation also would be added. I see. What does it mean if a patient has micrometastatic disease of the lymph nodes? Yeah, micrometastasis are a funny thing, and a funny because uh, we do not know what they mean. Uh, they are defined as mm, cancer cells that came from the breast to the axilla and are smaller than two millimeters by measurement. Mm -hmm. And why is it so unclear? Because these cells may have been dislocated by the surgery going to the axilla, or they may have gone in there prior to surgery, which mean through metastasis. So there's a number of pretty much, seven I believe, large randomized, uh, retrospective analyses of such patients, and basically the majority is giving the impression, and I'm, as you see I'm a little bit cautious, it's not 100% proof, but the impression is that micrometastatic disease in the axilla clinically means lymph node negative breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a bad sign or worse sign than it was. Obviously, if the cancer is confined to the breast, stage one, it's much better than its breast and axilla would be stage two or three. That's it. Would you explain what Oncotype DX is and do you <laughs> ever use that with triple negative breast yes. cancer? So, going into the 21st century, away from the 19th century, how big is the tumor and how many lymph nodes are there, mm -hmm. and going away from the 20th century, measuring three receptors, we are now wanting to measure many, many more because we understand how the molecular subtyping and the molecular profiling of these cancer cells influences outcome and may be giving us a choice of treatment. And there are about seven such tests available and another seven in development, but only two are really well uh, known and one of them, Oncotype, is widely used. About 80-85% of all tests are Oncotype. The other 15% are MAMA print. Mm -hmm. And they have one thing in common. They look at the molecular sets and subsets and composition of the cancer cell. Oncotype is a test which is based mainly on estrogen and HER2 and some other molecular markers. Overall there are 21. Six of them are so-called housekeeping genes and 15 of them are associated mm -hmm. with prognosis and predictive power. So because triple negative, these receptors are negative, we cannot use oncotype and we should not use oncotype uh, in triple negative breast cancer. Mama print looks 
a little bit different on the stuff. They identified the outcome first and then they looked into the molecule profiling and it turns out that about 70, 70 of genes are associated with either good or bad prognosis. Mm -hmm. So in triple negative breast cancer, this test might give, in a small but still significant portion of women and men, uh, the prognosis that might be a reasonable and good prognosis. The majority in triple negative will not. Yes, what if a patient does require chemotherapy? Are there any chemotherapies you favor over others? Um, there are probably 30 different type of chemotherapy regimens in early breast cancer. They have all been tested well and excessively, uh, and they are all effective. Some a little bit more, some a little bit less, and I don't think that statistically speaking, hence clinically speaking, the differences are major. Mm -hmm. The differences how I see them is based on toxicities. Mm -hmm. So the higher the risk of the cancer to return and kill the patient, the more toxic treatment I would accept for my patients to take. Mm -hmm. And if it's only intermediate or lower, but I still need to give chemotherapy, then I will look into lower toxicities type of profiles. And the major two toxicities that are associated with chemotherapy are cardiac problems, so inducing heart disease with chemo, and in very rare, but not zero instances, inducing secondary leukemia. Mm. So taking all together, if a treatment induces, let's say, 0.3% leukemia, but saves 30% of all women, then you see the risk-benefit ratio is in favor of giving the chemo. But if the chemo induces 1% toxic problems mm -hmm. and yeah. improves outcome in 1% of all, then obviously the benefit risk or risk benefit ratio is negative and I will not choose to. And should a patient's diet change while they're, they're undergoing chemotherapy? I think chemotherapy by itself is a very uh, tough uh, treatment. It's for a short period of time only, I must say. Short meaning anywhere between three and six months, rarely more in early breast cancer. So changing so much in the life of a woman is very difficult. Mm. Now if she's determined and wants to, then I think the changes that we uh, alluded to before mm. are appropriate. Can patients exercise or work while they're undergoing chemotherapy? Yeah, it's a very important thing and repeat, uh, this is for early breast cancer, so mm -hmm. stage 1, 2 and 3, not for stage 4 breast cancer. Uh, it's a limited time of uh, chemotherapy between 3 and 6 months and this chemotherapy is all outpatient and usually the major side effects are very short-lived, transient and relatively, relatively easy to deal with. And many of my women who want or must work usually get chemotherapy on a Friday and recover over the weekend and go back to work on Monday, latest on Tuesday. And similarly, I tell them, because exercise is good for your body and actually can reduce in the long run recurrences, don't stop exercise. And if you never started, start slow, mm -hmm. don't push, but still exercise even during chemotherapy. And what are your recommendations in terms of fertility preservation for either men or women undergoing chemotherapy? Yeah, that's a very, very uh, important topic. So let's suppose it's a woman, uh, and let's suppose she is young, menstruating, and does not have children, so she wants to have children in the future. So first I discuss with her, what are the chances that you actually will be here 10, 15, 20 years later for your children if you had any? Mm -hmm. Well, stage four is difficult and different, but in stage one and two, it's rather more easy because the majority of our women are cured. In stage three, it's a little bit less, but still very good possible. So that's why we do do it. Uh, there are no safe ways to preserve fertility. Uh, you can uh, discuss with a patient to uh, uh, harvest eggs, either fertilized or non-fertilized. Fertilized would be more effectively uh, harvested and uh, preserved than non-fertilized, but it may take months before it's successfully done. And you do not want to delay your treatment more than about eight weeks mm -hmm. after surgery. Mm -hmm. And eight weeks is a short period of time to have the harvest. Uh, there are some medications which suppress the ovarian function that can be given as an injection once a month, and they may be preserved fertility also. And I usually use it if the patient chooses so. I see. Well, what about for men? For men it's more difficult because we have no data. It's very difficult to do on such a small patient's population, as I said, 0.7% of all breast cancers, to do studies uh, because you just don't get enough uh, of these uh, 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 subjects on study. Once the patient's on a study, they call them subject, not the patient anymore. 
Uh, but what one can do similarly, and of course much easier, to harvest and preserve sperm in order to maybe later uh, impregnate a uh, spouse. And what are your recommendations in terms of sexual relations with a partner while someone's going undergoing chemotherapy? Uh, I, it's a very big topic in my own consultation with women uh, who, are, uh, who have a partner. I think it's extremely important that they know two or three things. Number one, you want during chemotherapy and about two to three years after avoid pregnancy. Number two, for not only health but also mental issues, you should not think you are not supposed to have sex on the opposite. It's part of our life and part of our quality of life. And finally, finally, the discussion with the partner. I have seen, unfortunately, not often, but maybe in the last, let's say, eight years or so, maybe three or four, when the partner left their spouse during this most difficult time of their lives. Mm -hmm. So preparing both partners, there may be some times when your spouse doesn't feel like having sex, doesn't want them, that's okay. Yeah. It may be different tomorrow. So as long as one discusses these things, then it can be actually over here. I see. And hair loss, obviously, especially women, is very important. What are your recommendations in terms of hair loss during chemotherapy? Yeah, hair loss um, is a very unfortunate, but of course not dangerous, uh, side effect. And uh, as it turns out, uh, many of our chemotherapy regimens for other cancers do not induce hair loss. For breast cancer, basically every chemotherapy induces hair loss. There are some exceptions. Too. And <clears throat> It's, it's the same thing. You need to discuss it, and the patient needs to accept it, and the partner needs to accept it. Mm -hmm. It's transient. Once you stop, hair starts regrowing. Uh, after one month, they look like you and I. <laughs> <laughs> and after half a year, they have their uh, hair. And after a year, it's long again. So it's transient, and it can be, it can be very difficult. How do you deal with depression and anxiety in your patients with breast cancer? You know, I'm not saying I go the easy way out because I refer them to my colleagues that I believe are better at it than I, but I also deal with things. I ask them, patients talk about this with me, and often just talking about problems increases spirits, if I may say, uh, mood. Um, but if it's very difficult, then uh, with the help of a psychologist, uh, we prescribe for a short period of time antidepressants, but it's not very frequent in my own practice. And they can actually come off once it's And of course. What are your recommendations for children or spouses of patients undergoing treatment? Yeah. Same thing, you, these spouses and children, and actually parents often too, they also need some counseling, uh, whether it's uh, with a primary oncologist or whether it's uh, with a professional uh, specializing in the field, it doesn't matter as long as it happens. Uh, and it's very necessary, particularly uh, susceptible uh, to problems are teenagers, both girls and boys. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. What usually occurs in, with menstruation and women undergoing chemotherapy, and does it recover, and how do you know if it does or not? Yeah. So menstruation <clears throat> is, of course, a healthy part of a healthy woman uh, during uh, the uh, mature uh, sexuality between the menarche and menopause. And <clears throat> Chemotherapy, for whatever reason, induces most of the time uh, that the menstruation stops. It does not mean that the patient is in a menopause. Mm -hmm. And even more importantly, it does not mean she cannot get pregnant. Actually, she can occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, with the treatments that we are using, most of the patient lose menstruation for a period of time. Uh, usually it's lasting anywhere between, and listen now, this is very important for them, uh, between three months and three years. Mm -hmm. If after two to three years the menstruation doesn't return, then you can be sure that the patient is menopausal. And it does not help us to measure the menopausal hormone levels. Why not? Because today she may be low in her levels, but in three months it may go back. So the rule of the thumb is about 40 years, 50% regain menstruation, and 50% do not. Mm -hmm. And the younger a woman is, the more likely she starts menstruating again. Well, what do you tell your patients regarding the odds of cure and the chances of recurrence in locally advanced triple negative breast cancer? Locally advanced breast cancer, particularly triple negative, is another <clears throat> type of breast cancer. Why? Because it cannot be easily removed by surgery. So what we need to do in order to make surgery possible, we'll give our treatments, and in triple negative we have only chemotherapy, remember, 
we give them chemotherapy prior to surgery. They call it, for the better or worse, neoadjuvant. Uh, and it just means that we give the same chemotherapy if we would give after, before. Turns out, in clinical trials have been shown that it doesn't matter to long-term outcome, but it makes the surgery easier and better possible. Cleaning the margins, having less lymph nodes involved, and so on. So that's a neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to surgery. Uh, the choice of treatments may be somewhat different. The choice of drugs may be somewhat different in a neoadjuvant setting because uh, we actually see whether or not the chemo works, mm -hmm. the tumor shrinks. Mm -hmm. In an adjuvant setting, when we give chemotherapy after surgery, what we discussed before, we don't see anything. We just give the treatment for the improvement in outcome and reducing recurrences. So the neoadjuvant does both reducing the cancer prior to surgery, and improve long term health. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kuhl. Uh, thank you. We hope this was educational. Next video, we will discuss the management of stage 4 triple negative breast cancer. Thank you.